السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم شعنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصحيحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين So I'm interested to know who my childhood friends are because I moved here when I was a teenager Curious. But anyway, <laughs> I'd like to start actually with a sentiment that I've been feeling since I landed here. Um, this is the place certainly of my youth. I've been in, I've, I've spent most of my adult life, I could still say safely, in this city. And I think I, I can safely say also I discovered Islam in this city. Uh, my Arabic teachers are from this city. My Quran teachers are from this city. Um, I owe basically what, what, whatever Allah Azza wa Jal has planned for me in my life is attributed to this place. So I have a special place in my heart for this city. And of course, some of my dearest friends, more than half of whom I've already successfully moved to Texas, are still in this city. Some of them are still left. I'm here back for them, but not for you, actually. I'm just gonna move all of them back. But anyway, when I do come back, especially when I hang out in Queens, I'm reminded of some poetry in the Arabic language. The poet says, Ya man ya'izzu alayna an nufariqahum وَجْدَانُنَا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بَعْدَكُمْ عَدَمُ He tells his friend, you know, it's so hard for me. You're, you're the one that it's so hard to part with. And everything I find after you is like finding nothing. Like I haven't really found anything once I left you. Not that I feel like that about New York. But there are certain things about this city that are just truly very hard to forget. And they have a really special place in my heart. So my du'as go to this community all the time. And as a matter of fact, just to, just to iterate my emotional attachment to this place and the gratitude I feel to some of the elders and you know, uh, the old friends that I have here, I, as a matter of fact, as a matter of policy, I don't speak at fundraisers. I can't. I can't do it. Uh, one, I, it's, it's a danger to my health. Uh, I'm allergic to boredom, so I can't do it. That's the first reason. The second reason is because if I say yes to one fundraiser, guess how many emails I get? About 1,000 a week for fundraising requests. And then if I say no to any one of them, they say, well, you like those guys, you hate us, huh? Well, we hate you back. So I start making enemies because I attended a fundraiser, so I, I can't do it. Unless one of the elders from New York calls me and says, hey, we're having a fundraiser. And I, I can't say no. So I gotta come back in May and do a fundraiser. And it's gonna kill me, but I'm still coming back, inshallah ta'ala. But anyway, that's just the sort of relationship I have with the city. Now, coming to the topic of tonight, uh, I actually chose a misleading topic on purpose. Find, you know, what's the topic that I gave you guys? Anyone even read the flyer? Huh? I know I, I, technically I came here late, which is okay for you to forget why you were here, but I came here late because I work on a certain process. I thought it was, this would be the same as a Pakistani wedding, which means I was three hours early. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, what was the topic again? Tell me. A balanced approach to religion, yeah, that is completely misleading. That is not what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Or at least that's what I wanted you to think, a balanced approach to religion. But there's in some truth to this topic. What I want to start with is a central theme of the Qur'an. That's where I want to start. So our minds are headed in a particular direction. I have an agenda for all of you tonight. And the agenda I have for you, the, the, the theme of the Qur'an I want to highlight is that of balance. Allah Azza wa Jal makes a pretty big deal out of talking about balance in one way or another over and over and over again in the Qur'an. It begins with the Fatiha. The idea of balance starts with Al-Fatiha and then it goes on to others. If your kids are really crazy, then take a walk, otherwise they're fine. If they scream louder than me, then they have to take a walk, otherwise they're fine. I have to put this on better? Okay. All right. So what was the theme in the Qur'an I was talking about? Balance. Now, the first example of balance I want to share with you is Al-Fatiha. Just some things about the Fatiha. At the end of the Fatiha, when we ask Allah for a straight path, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim, We actually also ask Allah to protect us from two possible directions that can go off the path. So on the one hand, صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ There's where we want to be. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ On the one hand, and al-dalleen wal al On the other hand, there are two possible roads that we don't want to be on. And if you can find the road in between, that is as-sirat al-mustaqim. Yes? 
So even if you don't look at a deeper analysis of those ayat of the Fatiha, you already appreciate something about balance. Now, a slightly deeper look. al maghdub alayhim is actually a reference to those who do wrong even though they know it's wrong. It's the kind of people who know something they shouldn't be doing. They do it anyway. Something they know they're supposed to do and they don't do it anyway. The people who don't care about what they know. In other words, what they want to do, what they feel like doing, what the urge says they should do, overrides anything that they know of to be right or wrong. So a young man gets angry at his parents and decides to just explode on them, just yell at them at the top of his lungs. And even if at the time he's reminded, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفِّنْ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا as the, mashallah, the young qari recited, don't you say even uff to them, which means don't you, don't you even look frustrated towards them. Don't even have that look. At the time he's reminded, he goes, I know, I know. But this is a special time. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know what my dad just did. And he justifies it. This is the kind of thing al maghdub alayhim do. They, they know something is wrong, but when the time comes to live by it, they say, I, I know, I know, but not right now. Well, actually, that was given to you for this occasion, not for another occasion when it doesn't apply. You understand? That's al maghdub alayhim. On the other side is, side is al-dalleen. Al-dalleen are people who do the wrong thing, sure. But it's not because they knew it and did it anyway. Actually, most of the time, al-dalleen the ones that are lost, do the wrong thing because they don't know any better. They just don't know any better. So somebody can, is it possible that somebody makes a mistake or does something wrong because they just didn't know it was wrong? Sure. Somebody can actually even practice an entire religion or live an entire lifestyle never realizing that this is the wrong way to live. Somebody can believe even within the Muslim community, somebody can believe something about this religion, about Islam, and live by it for a long time only to realize much later on in life but it has nothing to do with the religion. They were being manipulated. They were lost. And as and if you would think that you know the one who's lost, it's not their fault. But actually, because in the Fatiha we ask Allah not to be from them, we don't want to be from the people that are lost. It is as though we're asking Allah, what did I do again? What did I do? Oh, just the water? Okay. Sorry. I thought you were mad at me about the last thing I did to you. Okay. So they figure, you know, because we don't know any better, we're not responsible. But because we ask Allah to not be of those people, it is as though we're asking Allah, Ya Allah, make sure that we are of the people who do in fact know. Because people who know can't get lost. Just like when you know directions, you can't get lost. Just like when you know where to go, it's impossible for you to get lost. So by asking Allah not to be from those who are lost, it's like we're asking Allah to be of the educated ummah. It is like that. So now to summarize this, this brief idea of balance, on the one hand, you have people who know and do the wrong thing. On the other hand, you have people who don't know and therefore do the wrong thing, right? I'll summarize it one more time. There are people who have knowledge, but no good action. Knowledge, but what, what did I say? I need you to repeat so you stay awake. It's hot in here. <laughs> knowledge, but no good action. On the other hand, you have people of no knowledge, and therefore, no good action. You see that? Or they, they're acting out of good, they think it's a good thing they're doing. They're acting without knowledge. The balanced path is in between these two, isn't it? What is that balanced path? You have to have knowledge, and then you have to act according to that knowledge. Like you learn something in order to transform yourself. The knowledge of Islam is something that's supposed to transform you. If it's not making a change in you personally, then you're not really learning Islam, I'm not really learning Islam. Every ayah that we learn, every, every hadith that we learn, every little bit of Islam that we learn is supposed to cause some kind of change. It's meant to cause a kind of change. It's supposed to put us to motion in, in some way or another. Okay? So that's the first example of balance I wanted to share with you. The second is actually one of the most difficult areas of discussing this topic. In my opinion, it's very abstract, but I hope I can do a good job of explaining it to you, inshallah ta'ala. And that is when Allah actually in Surah Al-Rahman talked about the sky. He said, وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ mizan." The sky, in fact, He elevated it. And He put a scale in it. Now, before I go further, you need to appreciate something about that ayah itself. You see, in Arabic, you can say, رَفَعَ السَّمَاءَ he elevated, he raised the sky, and he put a balance in it. But he said, 
رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِزَانِ This is unusual language, which is almost impossible to communicate in translation. The grammatical concept involved here is called المشغول عنه And I know most of you don't know what that means. That's why I'm here. I'm here to make that simple, inshallah. Basically, the idea is when you do something that is extraordinary. Like you, you, you know, a child who's really lousy at homework. One time he does this homework and it's so neat. It's like the accomplishment of his or her life. If you have children, you know sometimes when they do math homework, they like to write their numbers on top of each other. So when they're doing multiplication problems and they're supposed to like line the numbers up, you literally have to draw a map of where one number goes under the other. So you have to teach them how to write the numbers neatly and they say, got it, and they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it again. But this one time, this child ma makes this homework assignment a masterpiece. The numbers are separated. And they're so beautifully, I mean, and the number that got carried over is in the right place. And he didn't draw an entire solar system around the number that got carried. It's so beautiful. And he says, this homework, I did it. <laughs> he doesn't just say, I did this homework. He kind of mentions his homework first. This right here. And then he says, I did it. The word it goes back to the homework, doesn't it? It's like he, he, he talked about the homework or she talked about the homework twice. Right? About the same thing twice. This is done when you want someone's attention of what you've done, on what you've done. You don't normally talk like that. Oh, oh, that flyer? I made that. Oh, that event? RMSA put that together. <laughs> you see, you said that event, and then put it, put it together. You mentioned it twice. That is when not only are you proud of what you've done, you want somebody's real attention on this accomplishment. You, you mention it twice. You get it? Now, Allah normally doesn't do this in the Quran. Normally, you don't find al-mash'ulu anhu. Allah created the mountains. He didn't say, the mountains, I made them. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, the rivers, I made them flow. He doesn't do that. But particularly for the sky, on more than one occasion, he said, وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا بِأَيْدٍ On multiple occasions, this rare concept of Arabic is used to illustrate the power, the majesty, and the, in, the focus Allah wants to have us develop onto the sky. He really wants us to focus on the sky. So I moved from New York to Texas. And the, the Chinese, when they used to work on the railroad in Texas, they used to say the sky is bigger in Texas. The reason they said that is they don't have any buildings out there. Right? You can see 10, 15 miles out. 10, 15 miles out for you is another country called the Bronx. <laughs> you know, that's, for you it's a different country. But in Texas, 10, 15 miles oh, right there. I'll see it right there. You know? In 15 minutes, you can get from your house to the next block in New York City in a car. In 15 minutes, you could be pretty much in Mexico or something. I, you could, it's open, it's wide open. But you know one of the things I don't miss about New York? I never looked at the sky. I just never looked at the sky. You're waiting on a bus, everybody's head's hanging low. You get into the subway. Everybody's trying to avoid eye contact, you know? You get into the city, you wouldn't want to look up because you bump into something, so you just kind of, everybody's just looking down here. Nobody has time to look at the sky. It's up, it's up there all the time, but we never look at it. And of course, this is a fast-paced city, so we don't have the time. We think people that sit around, you know, in a park, and they're just staring at the sky, have some kind of psychotic disorder, so we make sure we sit as far as possible from them in our lunch break or whatever, you know? So people that do spend time to just appreciate the sky must be weird. They can't be normal, you see? This is one thing I don't miss about this city. Is one of the, the appreciation of nature that you're supposed to have normally as a normal part of your life. And some things that Allah really wants you to pay attention to. Really, really wants your attention on. It's missing, it's just gone, it's taken from us. Those of you that drive, next time you get stuck in traffic, just take a couple of seconds to just kind of appreciate the sunset. Appreciate a shafaq, what Allah swears by. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالشَّفَقْ That act, just appreciating the beauty of the sky, is actually fulfilling a request of the Qur'an. Think of it like that. You just did something Allah wanted you to do. Just as simple as st staring at the sky. But now coming back to what, why did, he, what did Allah mention? وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا the sky, he elevated it. Now, how much higher is the sky from us? Infinitely higher, isn't it? It's the, we don't know the end of it. 
we can't put a number on how high above us the sky is. It's an, it's an abstract almost to us. And this ayah came in the context of how Allah honored the human being. And Allah first mentioned how He created the human being and He taught him how to speak. And then He says, by the way, I've honored other creations too. Just like I have raised your level, I have raised other things too, like the sky. So when, when you think about how much Allah has honored you, one of the things that will make you appreciate how much Allah has honored you, how high He made your status, think of the fact that He mentioned the height of the sky after you, not before you. He mentioned that after you. Now we're reflecting on the sky and Allah tells us what should we think about the sky. Please pay attention to this part because this is the part I'm worried about not being able to communicate clearly. He says, mizan." He placed down the scale. Al-Mizan and ism ala in the Arabic language comes from the word wazan. Wow, za and noon or zay and noon. Urdu speakers know wazan. Ha, wazan to humibi batay. Ha, ha. That one, same word. Wasn't means, typically it means weight. Weight. But actually, the word wasn't in the Arabic language is a device or a means, a mi'yar, by which you determine the value or the weight of something. And wasn't itself is putting a weight to something. And Allah says, Allah balanced the sky, and that's why mizan is called a balance, because on the, in the ancient times, the two sides of a balance, you put a standard weight on this side, and then you weigh something, rice, potatoes, whatever it is on the other side. When it balances out, it is this you know, piece of metal that is at a standard weight that determines the value of the food or the item you put on the other side, isn't it? That's why it's called al-mizan, because things are being weighed. Now Allah says He designed the entire universe, and He put a scale of balance in it. And He put things in proportionate weight in it. Now let's talk about this for a moment, even though I'm not a science person in scientific terms. If the sun was any bigger than it is now, then it would have more gravitational pull. And if it would, the planet wouldn't be where it is. It had to be a particular weight, a particular size. And the earth had to be a particular size not to get pulled in too close and not to get pulled away too far for the climate that we have to exist. Yes? Is this the only solar system around? No. Every solar system, every galaxy, every planet, every moon, every orbit is there in place because of a particular weight and a particular value to every planet. And that weight came as a result of every single atom that is on that planet. That's, that's where we got the weight of this, this planet of ours from. And Allah says He did that. He put that in place. So if it's even a little bit off, it'll fall apart. Now, just to make you appreciate what Allah is doing when He's balancing the universe. And the universe is too big to think about, so let's just think about the earth. The fact that He's balancing between the earth and the sun and the moon. You take a, like a toothpick and you try to balance something on it. Easy or hard? It's hard. It's hard. And you know, like my kids and I, sometimes we play Jenga blocks. You ever play Jenga blocks? Okay, you try to build Jenga blocks, the taller they get, easier to balance or harder to balance? I guess harder to balance. The more elaborate you build something, the more intricate the balance becomes. You can't do it anymore. E smaller things easier to balance, bigger things harder to balance. Now appreciate what Allah has done when He made balance between the sky and the earth. mizan. One more thing about, about this. Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator. You can even consider Him the manufacturer. وَلِتُصْنَعَ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِ Sunaa is used for Allah Azza wa Jal too the manufacturer. Now I mentioned that word in particular because we are a people, not just Muslims, but humanity today, are a people that are obsessed and are almost victims of brands and manufacturers. Right? And you can tell a particular brand by its signature design. So if somebody's holding a phone and it is of the I brand, you can tell from a distance. And some who are really good, man, you still got the five, you need to get the five C, S, P, W, whatever. <laughs> you need to, you know. Somebody else has, you know, a, a phone that's pretty much the size of a plate. You're like, oh, Samsung, okay, very good, you know. <laughs> you eat off of that too. But anyway, so <laughs> it does everything. So, <laughs> But the idea is when you have a brand, you know, there are brands cars, the, the cars that are, you know, certain elite brands, they have a certain design to them. And you can see it from a distance. You didn't even see the logo. You can say, oh, that, I know that car. That's a Mercedes. But you get closer, you find out it's a Hyundai because they copy everything. But still, <laughs> you know, <laughs> those Koreans, you know. 
confusing people's brand, you know, school of thought. But anyway, so the idea is we appreciate brand by the manufacturer, by the design. And not just the appearance, that's the one thing. By appearance, you can tell a manufacturer. But also when you take a closer look by the quality, you know, every company or every manufacturer has something that makes its brand sort of unique. You know, this, this manufacturer, their textile materials are really good. This builder, this architect, his buildings have this certain element to them. You know, this car, there's something unique about the transmission of this vehicle or the, the acceleration of this vehicle or the duration, you know, the durability of this vehicle, whatever it may be, right? So there are particular unique qualities of a brand that attract people. One of them obviously is appearance, right? But beyond the appearance, when you dig deeper, there's always something that kind of sets a company apart. This is their model, this is how, this is that drives everything they do, right? So uh, just to, because it's closer to home to everybody and we appreciate you know, how these things work nowadays, I mean, look at the Apple brand, for example. Their motto is, we don't care if it's the most user, uh, uh, most elaborate technology, we just care that it's the most user friendly. We just want it to be convenient. Convenience is our number one thing. And it's, it's, it gets so light, you can't even feel you have it in your hand. That's how light they want it to be. They eventually want it to float in the air. And then, you know, the, the icons are simple and easy to follow. And the easier it gets, the more it annoys geeks because geeks want, th want things to be complicated and they want to code it themselves. And they don't want to do any of that because they want it for people who are, you know, <laughs> they just want that. So that's the thing that, de that defines them. It's easy. Look at how easy it is. Look at how smooth it is, right? That's their signature. Now I bring all of this up because it's tied to the subject of balance. Because Allah says, pay attention to the sky and pay attention to my design signature as a manufacturer, as one thing I love in the things I create is balance. Allah's signature. Because like every, every painter leaves a signature on the painting. Every car leave its, leaves its logo. When Allah designs something, when Allah puts something together, his signature is what in the ayah? Is balance. Things are in order. Think multiple things are working with each other in harmony with each other. That's what he likes to create. I'll give you another example of the balance of Allah. That is so deep. I, if this lecture was just about that, I'll, I'll come back for that one. That, that's, that one's heavy. But I'll just give you a snippet of it. Allah in the Quran told us to pay attention to the honeybee. Okay, Allah revealed to the honeybee. And the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, interestingly enough, compared the believer to a honeybee. We got compared to an insect. You know when Allah does that comparison and the Prophet does that comparison, it makes me think, I really need to study Islam. And part of studying Islam is studying honeybees. When I studied that ayah, I must have watched four or five documentaries on honeybees. Easily. And I've read several articles on just honeybees. And every one of the lines I'm reading from, these are not written by Muslim scholars, by the way. But as I'm studying the honeybee, I'm, I'm not thinking I'm reading some secular article or I'm reading something that has nothing to do with Islam. I'm actually learning Islam. And one of the things I learned about the honeybee is when it sits on a flower, it can be far more aggressive than it actually is. It has the power to be. But it takes from the flower just so much to not break it and damage it and make it render it no good for the next bee to come. It, le it takes, but just so much. And then it leaves it. And it doesn't break, the, 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 there's a relationship between the flower and the, the bee, but it's a very loving, caring relationship. And actually, the bee gives it life because it carries pollen over to it and takes from it. So it never takes something without giving. And actually, it gives a lot more than it takes. It gives a lot more pollen than it takes. And it leaves, and it, because other bees from its hive may be able to benefit from the same flower, so it goes back to the hive and does a, what's called a bee dance. It does a dance and it lets the other bees know the address of that flower and its neighbors. You guys can have from that too. I've had my share. I don't need to have more. I'm not worried about competition. You guys can have enough. There's enough Allah made for everybody. Wow. Balance. The bee knows balance. And that's Allah's design from the universe to a bee. He just created things in balance. You know? Now, this is Allah's design as a manufacturer. Let's take it one step further. What Allah wants you to appreciate is how things work with each other in harmony. That's what balance is, really, when things are in harmony with each other and they're not falling into chaos. Down to the, the, uh, the atomic level. Things are, animals are in harmony with each other. There's an ecosystem in place. Environments are in harmony with the animals that live in those environments. 
Oceans are in harmony with the animals, the sea creatures that live inside them, right? Now this ayah, وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ mizan. Pay attention to the sky. Look at how he created the sky and put down a balance in the sky. The next ayah is the complication. أَلَّا تَطْغَوْ فِي mizan. I did all of that so that an here, an lit sababiya it's called. So I made the universe, the sky, balanced for the following reason. Here's the reason. Allah tatgaw ay antum. So you people do not violate in the matter of the scale. When it comes to balance, that you don't you don't mess up the balance. Allah is saying He made the sky balanced to teach you and to teach me the lesson of not losing our sense of balance. Now let me tell you how that works. There's a guy that runs a grocery store, probably in Flushing. And he sells all kinds of important goods like chaat masala and <laughs> bananas or whatever. You know, and just to make things in interesting, Indian movies, whatever. So, he's, so he sells this stuff. Now he puts, when the customer comes and he puts bananas on the scale and his scale is supposed to weigh is this one pound, one and a half pounds, two pounds or whatever. But he's kind of messed with the scale a little bit. So the, even if the customer puts like three quarters of a pound, it still shows one pound. Right? It still shows one pound, which means he can make, oh, I don't know, 50 cents extra, a dollar extra every time. He could pay, and if the state inspector is coming, then he can kind of fix it again and it's within the margin of error. You know, he could do that. I'm not, if you came from Flushing, I am sorry. I did not mean that personally. Okay. So, oh, by the way, Casino Boulevard in the house. <laughs> Just, <laughs> but anyway, so the, the idea in this ayah is that when that same grocery store owner, when he sees the state inspector, the FDA guy or whoever coming in to check the scales, he fixes it, Yes. But the idea of this ayah is so long as that grocery store owner has access to be able to see the sky, just the sky, that should be enough for him to set his act together. He looks up, sky is still in order. Oh my God, I better get my act together. The sky is a constant reminder to live a balanced life. The Quran changes the way the Muslim thinks. We're not a people of text only. Our text makes us profound thinkers about reality around us. We're supposed to see things in the reality around us that nobody else sees. Nobody else looks at the sky except say, say things like, oh, those are pretty clouds. That one looks like a teddy bear. But we see, I haven't called my mom in three days. I've been, I've been way too angry. I need to tone it down. You kind of explore your own balance because the sky's balance is there. And by the way, by the way, the irony of this creation that Allah made, Allah tatgaw fil mizan, I created the sky in balance so you don't violate the balance. The irony of it is that today, as we have it, the sky is in balance. But then a day is coming when the sky will be torn apart and it will lose its balance. It's going to be torn open. And when that day comes, then another scale will be established. Your scale and my scale. The mizan will be established. وَنَضَعُ mizan al qist لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ We're going to establish the scale that is absolute justice on Judgment Day. In other words, right now, so long as that balance is there, you're, you still got a chance to fix yourself. And the moment that goes away, your turn. How, were, how balanced were you? And then all of our debit and credit will be accounted for. The entire audit will take place. That is the reminder of the sky. That's what the sky is supposed to be. A balanced approach to religion, this is the first thing I wanted to share with you in this talk. And I, I, again, I want to tie this theme finally of how Allah Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, makes us think about this ourselves in the same way that He makes, in the same breath that He makes us think about the sky. He says, فَسَوَّى هُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتِ سَوَّى هُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتِ he balanced them, even them out into seven skies. Only Allah knows what seven skies means, but we know that He balanced them. So what to make something even. Okay? And taswi also means to make something equal. Okay. About the human being, He says, الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ فَسَوَّاكَ فَعَدَلَكَ He's the one who created you and He's the one who put balance in you. He balanced you. 
Now, when Allah says He balanced me, He's talking about the physical balance for sure. But He didn't just say, Sawaka jasadan, sawaka badanan, sawaka jisman. He, phys he physically balanced you so that your two feet, you stand up and you're balanced. You can uphold yourself. You can, you can hold your neck. You know, a child, a baby's neck goes everywhere. But as the child grows, they can hold themselves up high. They learn to balance themselves on their two feet and they don't walk like a gorilla anymore. They can, they can stand up. This is a kind of balance. But Allah didn't limit the conversation to physical balance. When Allah doesn't limit something, we don't have the right to limit it. It's called a tawassu fil ma'na, expanding the meaning. So Allah balanced us in every possible way. Every possible situation you're going to come across in life, there is something Allah put inside you that can help you attain balance. That's what He put in you. Then He made evened you out. Even He, he went further than the sky. Sawahunna, that's it for the sky. But sawaka fa'adalak also, on top of that. So He did something special for you He hasn't done for any other creation. I felt this conversation was necessary for the, for the following you know, multiple reasons. The first reason I wanted to bring up this conversation is because the world itself is losing balance. We don't have pretty much everything that used to be in place and was balanced and nobody questioned it is all falling apart. From the simplest things to the way we eat food, we don't have balanced nutrition anymore. Our nutritions are overwhelmingly you know, poisonous to us. Uh, there was a survey done in the United States of nutrition. 85% of what you find in a grocery store is saturated with fat and, uh, ar fat and sugar, artificially. Which means you're, you and I are not, you know, you, even, or you say, I'm going to go healthy, I'm going to go buy bread. Just look on the side of the ingredients, for, even for your bread. You know, fructose, corn syrup, this much sugar, this much, you know, preservative. Oh my God, I thought I was eating bread. We're losing balance in even our nutrition. And by the way, what we eat it affects us even spiritually. It has an impact on us. This is from the advice of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In any case, we don't have balance in that. We don't have the balance between work and family. We no longer have that balance. People that, that are really successful in their career have really terrible family lives. And they say, well, I had to make some sacrifices. People have had to work to earn a living throughout history. Nobody had a free ride. Nobody had a free ride 2,000 years ago. Nobody had a free ride 5,000 years ago. Nobody has a free ride today. Everybody has to work. We're not in any different position than before. But people were able to maintain a balance between work and family. And then between work and family and the self. Just having time for yourself. People used to be able to do that. Now people are really successful career-wise, but they don't even have time for themselves. They're only working and they're miserable. And when people are miserable, they're really good at making other people miserable around them. You know? We have no balance in life. People say, I want to study. Young, young students, you know, men and women, I want to study. But I also want to get married. So, but you know what? I'm going to finish med school. And then I'm going to finish law school. And then I'm going to think about getting married. Um, and then you finish med school. Um, and if you're Pakistani, you're past the expiration date. I'm sorry. And then, you're, then you come to Ustad Naman, nobody proposes. Because I'm a doctor and I'm 28. Oh, 28? That's like haram in Pakistan. It's like, <laughs> that's like you're, that's on the one side. We, we, even career-wise, we've pushed a certain idea. Why can't you get married while you're in school? Why not? Especially if you've taken the long road to school. You, this needs part of your plan. You need to balance between your career goals, your educational goals, your family goals. It's not one, you, can, you don't stop one part of your life and then do another, then stop that one part of your life and do another. We have this approach towards religion. Somebody says, I want to study deen, which means I must drop everything and study deen. Okay, I just want to serve, study deen. So what's, what, are you, what else are you going to do? Nothing, just study deen. <laughs> Who's going to take care of your parents? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> <laughs> We, we've created such an imbalance in our minds, all or nothing, overdose of everything. When you go into something, you really go into it. When you abandon something, you totally abandon it. Right? We're not able to juggle multiple things at the same time, or at least not in a successful way. And this is actually a lot loss of balance in our personal lives. And because most of humanity is so prone towards one kind of imbalance or another, we've taken this idea, this, this tendency that we have, and we've started looking at our religion in an imbalanced way. Human beings were created naturally balanced. 
When we lose that nature, then we lose the ability to look at things in a balanced way. And unfortunately, if you yourself or I myself are suffering from imbalance, then, and then we study our religion, then we were, we we're going to come up with imbalanced conclusions about our religion. We're not going to come up with the right conclusions. You have people, for example, in cultures where women are treated like garbage. They're treated on Muslim cultures. I have to say it like it is. They are treated like garbage. And we, when these women get even a little bit of an education, and they find even a little bit of independence, they want nothing to do with this religion. You know why? Because they, they, them being treated like garbage was constantly justified through the lens of the religion. Ayat were quoted at them. A hadith were quoted at them. And they were told, this is why you're nothing. This is why you can't get an education. This is why you, 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 know, you just have to serve. Your position is this. There are Indo-Pak women that have lived in their kitchen for 50 years. You know how psychologically traumatic that is for a person? Why do you think they're horrible mother-in-laws? It's not their fault. They, honestly, I know, you're like, no, my mother-in-law is it's her fault. It's her fault. And the mother-in-law sitting here is like, I knew it was my fault. <laughs> Just record that part and give it to me. <laughs> she loops it when the, kid, when the daughter-in-law comes over. It's not her fault. It's not her fault. It's not her fault. <laughs> but you know what? Religion was quoted to them. I have students that want to come to me. They come to me and they study deen. They study Arabic with me. And they study you know, Islamic studies with Sheikh Abdul Nasir. They come to Texas from all over the United States. And you know, when, I, when I teach them and they learn something, then they come to me and say, these are sisters in hijab. And they've traveled to study. And they've memorized Quran. And Ustad, there's this one hadith. It hurt me so much. I'm sorry to say it. I, I, don't, I don't know another way to say it. It just hurt me so much. I was like, tell me, what, what, what hadith is it? And she tells me the hadith. And I'm sitting there like, who did you hear this from? Because it's not the hadith that's imbalanced. It's not the ayah that's imbalanced. It's the guy representing it. The guy teaching it. The person who doesn't have balance themselves is going to paint the entire religion in a corrupt way, meeting their own, or in light of their own personal psychological problems. And what that's done for an entire generation of Muslims is it scared them away from Islam. A balanced approach to religion, if you don't have it, you're going to see an exodus from the religion. You're going to see people running from the religion. You have, you know, the hadith of, you know, Umayma radiallahu ta'ala anha. She comes and complains to the Prophet sallallahu And actually, this is a famous hadith. I'll tell you one part of it. And I sat with Shaykh, uh, Shaykh uh, um, actually, he's the gem over here. You have Shaykh Abdullah Adhami about this hadith. And he explained this to me. And I, I was in tears like, you have to come to our campus and explain this to our, our students. And he said, he can't travel. So you're lucky, he can't even travel. He's here. You're just lucky. So anyway, I'm, I'm talking about this hadith. And this hadith is used to quote or to tell people that women should pray in the innermost part of their home. The most private part of your home, that's where you're supposed to pray. Okay? And this is hadith is used to justify that you shouldn't come to, women shouldn't come to the masjid. They should pray in the innermost part of their home. You study the entire hadith, you, first of all, there are other hadith also. Other hadith where women complain to the Prophet ﷺ, we come for Salatul Fajr. Where do they come? Al Masjid al Nabawi. We come to Salatul Fajr. But on our path, on our way, there is sewage. So it gets on our clothes. Can we stay home and pray? He said, no, the rest of the dirt on the way will wipe it off because you should still come. And that's Fajr for women that have to go through sewage to come to pray at the Masjid. We don't quote that one. By the way, Umayma's story, this woman who the Prophet told you should pray in the innermost part of your home, when she asked to pray at the masjid, when you learn the whole story, you learn some lots, lots of fun things. She was in a troubled marriage. Her husband was super jealous of her, like protective of her. He used to poke her while she prayed. <laughs> yep. And the Prophet called, because she came to the Prophet in another narration, she came to him and said, he pokes me while I pray. And so he asked her, why do you, why do, you do that? He goes, she stole my surahs. <laughs> in other words, he led her in prayer. She heard his Qur'an. She memorized it. She started praying on her own. He's like, she's praying all by herself? 
I'm not leading her in prayer. And actually, he felt left out that she was praying on her own. So she used to poke her in Salat. And then she, when he comes to the masjid to pray, he gets really angry because he's so obsessed with his wife. He can't spend 10 minutes without her. So the fact that she's in the, in, you know, in the masjid, it just drives him crazy. He just wants her with, her with him all the time. So the Prophet ﷺ told her, look, you need to save your marriage first, basically. Your marriage is in shambles at this point. You need to spend more time at home. And it currently... The better thing for you is not to come to the masjid. And by the way, in order that he doesn't poke you, find the innermost part of your home to pray so that at least you can pray in peace because he's driving you nuts. Now, if you don't know the background and you say women should pray in the innermost part of their home and somebody who's got like a psychological disorder against women, you know, and he gets married and he's yelling at his wife because she didn't pray in the closet and he pulls out the hadith, you know, He's got the dalil, he's got the evidence, but he's, there, there's no balance. There's, this is not balance, you see? This is a, you know, I mean, it's funny, but it's also really, really sad. People's lives are ruined in the name of deen. In the name of deen. This deen that came to remove sadness. This deen that came to provide human beings the opportunity to live a balanced life in everything that they do. We have so fragmented the idea of balance in our lives. I was on an interview with a student group in Pakistan. Uh, it was like a radio thing, like online radio thing. And so there were live QA, and the student asked me in the QA session, he asked me, well, how am I supposed to practice my religion during exam season? I don't have time to practice Islam during exam season. I have to focus on my studies. And for a moment, I was so stunned by the question, I didn't know what to say. I was just completely baffled. I did not know what to say. And here's why I didn't know what to say. In this poor guy's mind, if you are doing something for religion, you have to stop everything else you're doing. You see? Serving religion to him means somehow you can't be studying for your exams. I was like, the fact that you're studying for your exams and you're not cheating like every fourth guy in your classroom and you're not paying off the teacher to give you a higher grade and the fact that you're doing due diligence to the money your parents worked hard to pay for your schooling for you are observing your religion. And what is it, how long does it take you to take some time out and make salat? I don't have time. You take cigarette breaks. I know. You're in Karachi. I know. <laughs> you don't have time for some salat. What do you mean I don't have time to practice my religion? What do you think the religion is asking you? Because you know what people, when they think of religion, they just think of prayer, going to the masjid, fasting, memorizing, acts of worship, certain things. That's religion. Everything else is just life. They're just separated things. That's an imbalanced view. That itself is an imbalanced view, you know. So we have to, this, this is a serious, serious matter in my view. Developing a balanced way of thinking. I know, I know it's really serious. <laughs> Developing a really balanced view towards this. Now, in the ayah I told you, we look at the sky and we find balance, yes? We're reminded of balance. Allah says, وَأَقِيمُوا الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْطِ وَلَا تُخْسِرُوا الْمِيزَانِ Another ayah in the same passage, by the way, now that you've observed the sky, and now that you've learned I made the sky so you find balance, then he says, whenever you establish wasn't, and wasn't means when you weigh something, do it, make sure you're not unfair. Al-qist actually doesn't mean fairness, it's lughatul al-dad. Al-qist in Arabic means to make sure that you're not biased, that you're not unfair. That's what al-qist means. Allah says, when you're going to weigh between things, make sure you don't become unfair. We have to stop here and figure out what that means for us personally. Not every one of us is a grocery store owner. So we don't have a weighing machine at home. So we say, well, this ayah is about, you know, weigh with balance. No, but al wazan also has majaz in it. It's figurative language also. What that means then is, in your life, there are lots of relationships. You have siblings, younger siblings. You have parents. A lot of you are college students, so you're not, many of you aren't married yet. So you have your parents. You have your studies. You have friends. You have community, you know, you have the MSA, what, the, change, the definition of which changes year by year or semester by semester. You know, you have lots of relationships in life. And Allah says you have to establish a balance, and yourself by the way, yourself also, your own religious growth also, your own spiritual growth also, your own physical well-being as well. You have to balance all of this stuff. When Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes to Abu Darda's house, and he sees, this is before the ayat of hijab. They used to go to, and the, you know, so she came out. 
And she was complete, she looked like she went through a tornado or something. Mutabaddila is used for her, which is a really like, heck, she looked like a wreck. That's how I'll translate it. She looked like a wreck. And he looked at her and he said, what is wrong with you? And he, she said, your, your, your brother, meaning Abu Darda, has no interest in this world. He's always doing ibadah, he's always worshipping, praying, da'wah, etc., etc. He has no time for me, so why should I make myself look nice and, you know, why should I have a romantic life? It's, he's, just, he's just lost in the world. And actually, when a woman doesn't take care of herself like that, actually it means that she also, she's suffering. She's suffering, she's sad. And the fact that she immediately, when he said, what's wrong with you, instead of making excuses, she was blunt about it and said, it actually has to do with my husband, he doesn't care. He doesn't even look at me. And I've, I've turned myself into this and he still doesn't look at me. And doesn't even, you came and said what's wrong with you. He never said that. Right? So then he comes to his house and he says, Abu Darda is a good host. He says, eat. He said, I'm not going to eat until you eat. He said, I'm fasting. He goes, break your fast and eat with me. This is before the ayat of Ramadan. Salman al-Farsi made him break the fast and they ate together. Then uh, Salman al-Farsi is about to go to sleep. He says, why don't you sleep? You know what I'm going to pray. Sleep, bro. He made him sleep. And then he got up for Qiyam and then he woke him up and then he, they prayed. And then he turned to him and he gave him some brotherly advice. This is Salman al-Farsi talking to his brother, his friend. And he says, Inna li rabbika alayka haqqan. Your Lord, your master, in fact, he does have rights over you or right over you. Wa li nafsika alayka haqqan. You have to take care of yourself too. Your own personal self has rights over you. Allah is not asking you to sacrifice yourself. And your daily life for him. He's not asking that. And then, Wali ahlika alayka haqqan, and your family, your wife has rights over you, man. You gotta take care of your wife. Fa'ati kulla di haqqin haqqahu. Then give everyone who has a right their right. Give everybody their right. Now, this is Salman al Farsi. He's not a prophet, he's a Sahabi, a very wise one at that. And he's giving another Sahabi some advice. Look, you're going a bit overboard with the whole prayer thing. You haven't lied down in, in bed next to your wife for I don't know how long. And look at her, she's depressed, like you, don't, you hate her or something. You know? You need to give your wife some time. What's wrong with you? Why are you fasting all the time? Stop fasting, eat something. You know? By the way, if, the, if, if he stops fasting, at least he's going to have lunch at home. And when you have lunch, you're going to sit with your wife and eat. And eating with your spouse also is an act of love. When the husband and wife don't eat at the same time, it, destroy, it breaks the home apart, you know that? Eating together itself is an act of love. It keeps a household together. How often is it you eat together? How often? And you tell the wife, hey, come eat. No, no, I already ate. No, I'll eat later. Or the, the wife is eating and she says to the husband, no, no, hold on. The Kobe report's on. Hold on, I'll eat. Which is also imbalanced because you shouldn't eat that late. You know? We don't eat together. The advice is really profound. So Abu Darda, because you know, he wants to take this advice, but he needs to know if this is legit. He goes to Rasulullah and he says, Sadaqa Sulaiman, Sulaiman's right. Sulaiman's right. Sulaiman al-Farsi is right. You, sh you should do that. The Prophet validated all of the things in the order that Sulaiman said. Why? Because we've got to balance this stuff. We don't go into one thing and forget about everything else. You know? This is the core issue of imbalance. I want to get to a couple of ayat, inshallah ta'ala, after I give you a break, because I, I, I respect the attention span. I'm only going to have two sessions with you, bi'ithnillah. One before and after the break, and I'm almost there well, by, to the point where I can give you a break, inshallah. You guys doing okay so far? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. There's other balance. Balance in belief. So hard. I recently, just uh, actually on the flight here, uh, I checked my email. And I received an email from a Jordanian man who was Christian, born and raised Christian, Arab Christian, uh, moved to England to do higher studies, and found his faith, meaning Christianity, later on in life, started going to the church regularly, married a British woman, lived a very spiritual life, actually volunteered at the church, studied the Bible with the, with the minister, and you know, he, was, he was actually very engaged in biblical studies for a long, 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 long time. And he started developing certain questions later on in life, about, uh, surrounding the, uh, the birth of Isa alayhi salam, the virgin birth, he developed certain questions. And he asked his minister to answer those questions, and he, the answers that he gave actually made him lose faith even more. So he started getting distanced from religion because of the answers he got to his questions. 
And later on, he actually uh, uh, just kind of, he was stuck looking for the answers to those questions, but he was looking for those answers in Arabic. He was doing the search on Maryam Salamun Alayha in Arabic. And if you do Google searches on Maryam, you're going to find Christian sources, but you're definitely going to run into what? Muslim sources, Islamic sources. sources. And his email, he said, وَقَدْ عَرَفْتْ أَنَّ الْمَسِيحِيَّةِ مِلْيُونَ دَرَجَةِ أَحْسَنْ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ I knew, I knew that Christianity is a million times better than Islam, but I read it anyway. I read the Quran anyway. And all of my questions were answered in such a balanced way in that one place. All the questions that were raised for me in the Bible, all of them were resolved in one passage about Mary, in one place. And I took that to my minister and he got really mad at me. Then my wife threatened to divorce me just because I quoted a passage from the Quran. Then on top of that, pretty much everybody left me. All my friends, everybody left me. And I haven't even accepted Islam. I just quoted the Qur'an, that's all I did. And they panicked, you know. And then he's telling me what he's been studying over the last few years, he's been just studying the Qur'an, still hasn't accepted Islam. When he wrote me this email, he still hadn't accepted Islam. He said, Maybe you're going to ask me when I became Muslim. I haven't. But I can't stop reading Qur'an. That's what he told me. It's like something's in me that I, you know, something's in me that's keeping me. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's something else. But I do find one thing. And he told me, what I find in the Qur'an is balance. That's what he told me. It's what attracted him is balance. Things are in order. Not one thing overboard. You don't take one prophet and make him into divine. It's imbalanced. It's too far. You took it too far, you know. And so we're going to talk, inshallah, after the break, we're going to talk about how within the religious discussion, Within religion, how can you lose balance? You know? And you might not even realize it, but you, you and I may have an imbalanced approach to the study of our deen. And how do we make sure that we have a balanced approach to our, our deen that we can pass on to a generation that comes after us? Because wallahi, 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 if we fail to do that, then our next generation will not have something that they will want to keep. They're not want, they, if you, we don't give them a balanced religion, they're not going to want to keep it. Our deen is beautiful. It has to be presented in the most beautiful way. It really, really does. So enjoy your first break. I'm going to give you exactly 10 minutes. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thumma amma ba'd. I'd like to start with this session, inshallah, with uh, an Arabic word and some, some vocabulary for you. Uh, and I think this will structure our conversation in a a good direction. Uh, the, the word in the Arabic language is al uh, The root letters are ghain, lam, and waw. Ghulu. For the three of you that are taking notes. Okay, al ghala they say in Arabic, naqid al The word ghala literally means um, expensive, to be expensive, to be high-valued. Something that is unusually pricey uh, or, you know, um, inflated in value has ghulu in it, or ghala in it. That's why it's the opposite of arrakhs, which means cheapness. Uh, ghalla is also used in Arabic when you overfeed someone, or you overestimate the value of something, and you overconsume it, and it poisons you. So sama, ghalla comes in the meaning of poisoning also. And the idea here is, just because something's expensive, uh, and you say, well, I, you got an opportunity to consume it, you consume too much of it, and it can actually kill you, it can hurt you, right? Then... The word ghala also means majawazatul qadr or majawazatul had fi kulli shay. Going overboard in any matter is called ghulu. In other words, putting a, because it came from the idea of expensive, when you value something above other things and therefore you give it more of your time, more of your attention, spend more of your money on it, etc., then you are engaged in the idea of, or the crime of ghulu, really. Al ghulu also leads to, the Lisan al Arab argues, al i'da. It leads to animosity against others. In other words, when you value something really, really high, you end up violating somebody else's rights and therefore make, end up making enemies. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is when you value something really high and you're all about it, that's all you do all the time, then eventually you burn out and you hate the very thing you loved. The idea is when you really, you're really into something, like I'll give you an example of, a contemporary example of ghulu, is some song comes out and people are downloading it and they love it and they're listening to it like a hundred times, they've looped it and they're listening to it over and over and over again and a week goes by and if they hear it, they have a severe allergic reaction, like I hate that, turn that off. 
I'm tired of it, you see? So that's actually ghulu. You, you took too much of it until it almost became poisonous to you and now you hate it. You can't stand it anymore, okay? So that's what happens even when you take something that you love and you go too far in it, then you lose that love for it. You have to take it in moderation. That's the idea behind ghulu. And then finally, al-maghali. This is an interesting term because the Arabs like to think of you know, abstract ideas of like going overboard or being extreme, they like to think of it in the, in the sense of imagery. So they say, Al-Maghali bis-Saham, Al-Mughali bis-Saham, Al-Rafi' bis-Saham, Yuridu bihi aqsa al-Ghaya. So there's a guy with a bow and arrow, and he's stretched his arrow as far back as it can possibly go, and he's held it up high at an angle, the aim of which is to go further than any other arrow shooter has ever gone. His purpose isn't to hit a target, his purpose is to go farther than anyone has ever gone. He wants to break the record, basically, of distance, right? So to go really far, or to aim to go further than anyone else in something, that is ghulu. So for instance, you have, uh, nowadays we're in the age of video games, right? So you have, you know, PlayStation and Xbox or whatever. These, the, the video games that come out, they have an online component now, right? So and they have rankings. So you're, you're like the 38,563rd deadliest assassin in Assassin's Creed, right? <laughs> And if you really suffer from ghulu, you will not sleep until you're number one. And you will like pat yourself on the back when you reach 25,000 and then 11,000 and eight, I'm ranked 8,000, you know? I had a student this year at the dream program, we introduce ourselves in the beginning of the year and one of our obligations, the way we introduce ourselves is you tell me where you're from, what your name is, where you're from and tell me one interesting about, thing about yourself. So one student said, my name is so-and-so, I'm from this place, I'm, I'm ranked 115 in FIFA. <laughs> I've been calling him FIFA for eight months now, so six months, <laughs> you know. But that's a, it's a form of ghulu where you, keep wanna, you wanna keep breaking records and you don't even know why you're doing it, you just wanna do it. You wanna earn all the trophies. You wanna get 100%. You wanna land that combo in the game and you're gonna keep practicing it like it, you know, your akhirah depends on it, you know. You know, there are people that have ghulu, uh, you ever heard of, uh, what's that? Comic-Con, I think it's called, right? Comic-Con? Like, and so that where people master like things like Street Fighter and like there are Mortal Kombat tournaments and people from all over the world that have spent hundreds of hours trying to like perfect the 18 hit combo from Akuma or something. That's Hulu. That's Hulu. There are people that become movie buffs. They have to have a collection. They have to have seen everything. They have to have all this trivia. People that become sports buffs, they, be, they get hulu in sports. Right? They, have to have, they know all the statistics. I mean, they're, they're literally, their riwayat are sahih. From like, where this guy went to college, who recruited him, what his career was, how many, you know, how many rings has he earned, all of it. It's incredible. But it's all hulu. It's overboard. It's overboard. You keep going digger, deeper and deeper and deeper. You become an enthusiast and eventually a fanatic. An example, a contemporary example of Hulu, of course, it's not as, it's not as uh, hot anymore, but it was for a long time, Star Wars. Right? Star Wars is a kind of Hulu. People went to Star Wars movies dressed in ihram and proper, like, legit attire, <laughs> you know. And this is serious stuff. I mean, people take this stuff very, very seriously. When you get into something, you really get into something. A social media example of Hulu would be people that, are, that can't get off of their Facebook page, like that lady over there. You know, no, nobody, I just, I just pointed randomly. I just, the guy's like, which one? <laughs> I've done that pretty much every speech I've given. That never gets old. But at least she got off of Facebook. Anyway, so, <laughs> so why am I dividing ghulu for you? Because two places in the Quran, Allah turned his attention to the Christian community, not us. The Christian community. Allah says, Ya Ahl al Kitab, la taghlu fi dinikum. People of the book, don't do ghulu, what I just described to you. Don't become extreme. Don't go overboard in your religion. Which is very strange language, especially for the Christians. I've, sp I've spoken to multiple denominations of Christians in my limited career. And I have gained lots of insights from the study of the Bible recently. More recently, I've been studying the Bible in order to understand the Qur'an better. Not to verify the Qur'an, but to appreciate the beauty and the perfection of the Qur'an by studying the Bible. I can't be begin to tell you how profoundly it has changed my appreciation of the Qur'an. It really, really has. And even the study of Christian history has changed my appreciation of the Qur'an. It's a new dimension altogether. 
give you a little taste just before, because I mentioned that tangent. I have to give you a little taste. Just a little santi santi sain sain. Okay. <laughs> so, you guys have heard of the people of the cave? Did you know there are churches to this day uh, around, in, in, uh, you know, around the ancient city of Ephesus? Churches to this day in parts of Jordan, in Turkey, you know, in Greece even, that have, you know how ch- churches have stained windows? They have stained windows with paintings of seven people caved up, bound inside a cave, and a dog with them. Yep. And they have a day of the feast. They celebrate the saints that died inside for their faith. They were true Christians. And they, they sing a chant that a Greek minister wrote. And when they sing it, they believe that the saints' souls come back into the church and they pray for them. And there's actually a place where they believe in the, the ancient city of Ephesus. It's pretty funny. In Turkey, there's a big sign that says, seven sleepers this way. <laughs> it's silly. But anyway... So they go there and they actually, a lot of Christians actually from those denominations, they go and they pray there like for a few days. They stay there because they want this, those saints to bless them, right? So they literally became awliya to them. The Ashabul Kahf literally became awliya to them. And if you read Surah Al Kahf, you will find that they were the ones that said, Allah has no awliya, right? So because they became awliya, Allah came to their defense. And this is not in the Bible, this is poetry written afterwards, right? This is not in the Bible. But uh, they had been taken as awliya and Allah Azza wa Jal came to redeem their integrity as people of Tawheed. You know? And they, their, actually their legacy, unfortunately, had become the exact opposite of what they came to preach. So Allah set the record straight. You know? Subhanallah. And but, you, but you won't appreciate how clear the truth is when you, uh, until you study the legend of the seven sleepers from different civilizations. And you see what they have to say and you compare it with the Qur'an and you say, Oh, Ya Rabb, wow, it's incredible. And that's just one example. I've been reading some other stuff too, but I'll tell you about it later. Okay. Ya Ahl al-Kitab. People of the book, la taghlu fi dinikum. Don't go overboard in your book. Don't go overboard in your religion. Don't go overboard in your religion. How can that be? The Christian community, many denominations of it, basically abandoned the law of God. They said the Bible's laws no longer apply to us. We don't have to abide by them. The blood of Jesus is enough to save us. We're already saved. The law was a means by which our souls were cleansed. We no longer need the law because Jesus already paid for our sins. So how can they go overboard in their religion? They got nothing to go overboard in. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about? What Allah azza wa jalla is talking about now is something very powerful and we have to really, really understand this. Our beliefs, not just our practices, our beliefs are about balance. Our balance. We have to balance our beliefs about Allah with our beliefs about the prophets, with our beliefs about the angels, with our beliefs about the books, with our beliefs about the afterlife, there are these, a lot of these unseen realms, right? And even the prophets have become, in a, in a sense, the unseen to us because they're in history to us. They're the unseen to us too now, right? And even to those who were in front of them, the fact that they are messengers was also a belief in the unseen because they see a physical man, they don't see the angel talking to him. They don't see the ayat coming down. Even believing in a messenger in his physical presence was a belief in the unseen. But these unseen matters, you have to keep a proper, a very delicate balance between all of these entities. And if the only thing that can keep that balance is the, the authentic revelation from Allah. When you lose touch with that revelation, you start coming up with your own ideas about Allah and what He means. Your own ideas about the Prophet and what He means. Your own ideas about revelation and what it might mean. And your and you decide to highlight some things, emphasize some things, and de-emphasize other things entirely on your own terms. And if you have the right to do so, then the next person following this religion has the right to do so. So you end up with an innumerable amount of variations in beliefs. And you're all calling yourselves Muslims, or you're all calling yourselves Christians. We're living in those times. So you have, for example, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of different kinds of podcasts. One of the podcasts I listen to is Speaking of Faith. Uh, yes, I listen to NPR. Yeah, it's sad, but I do. So this, this uh, 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 show, Speaking of Faith, they interviewed uh, three or four uh, American Muslims, right? Faith in, faith, uh, Islamic faith in America. That's what the show was called. It's an interesting podcast. And these, all four of these people, three women and one guy, originally the guy's from Afghanistan. I think that one of the women's originally Irani. Her ancestry is Irani. Another one's Indian. Uh, another one's Arab, I think. And they're all... Talking about, well, you know, here's what Islam means to me. 
Islam actually doesn't mean to me that you have to believe in a God. You just have to believe in a higher power. So long as you believe in a higher power, it's fine. And then the other one introduced herself. She said, I am the alcohol drinking, uh, fornicating, blah, blah, blah. And she made a list. And at the last adjective she gave herself was Muslim. And proud. You know? And as I'm listening to this, uh, close to getting into a car accident, I realized something. I realized something. We are living at a time where people will decide the terms of their religion themselves. We are living in a religious, religiously free society. Whether you practice this faith or don't practice it is, is entirely up to you. No matter how much somebody yells and screams at you, you're going to make your own decisions, aren't you? And so everybody, you know, every person sitting here may end up with a very different and vari very dis understanding of what Islam actually means. There is going to be a variation. That's a natural inevitable fact. There's no denying it, there's no hiding from it, there's no running from it. The only thing we can do, instead of yelling and screaming, by the way, the group that yells and screams the most gets listened to the least. The group that gets the frustrated the most and gets angry at the people the most, why are they not believing like we do? We quoted the ayat, they still don't listen to us. Yeah, that's why they don't listen to you, because you talk like that. I mean, people who are listening to you don't want to listen to you. You know, it hurts their ears. But the group, the, the, the variation of, and people are experimenting, right? Even Muslims, they're experimenting with their religion. If you go to different communities and you talk to different circles, this is one kind of circle. But I've had the blessing of go to, going to different Muslim circles that aren't so religious, but they're Muslim too. And they define religion for themselves very, very differently. Not the same way as you and I would. And we're not used to that. But you know what will survive after all of these experiments? What will survive is what meets the, what meets the test of reason and what, what can balance the needs of the heart and the, the mind at the same time. The balanced view will survive. Everything else will wither away because people will get tired of it. It just doesn't last. It's a phase people go through and it burns out. I want to tell you in this opportunity that I have before you a little New York story as I get to these ayat. La taghlu fi dinikum. Don't go overboard in your religion. When I was a college student in 1875 in New York City, <laughs> I, I was at Baruch. Baruch in the house, by the way? Baruch in the house? All right, very good. Like three people. Very good. <laughs> Nothing much has changed at Baruch College. Okay. <laughs> I did a year in Queens too. I'd done time here. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so when I was at college in New York, I wasn't really interested in religion. But when I found religion, uh, New York is one of the coolest places to find Islam. Because you get every possible flavor of Islam. Every possible one. I'm not, I'm not sure if that has changed much. Is it, is it still as colorful? It's still pretty colorful? Okay. And depends on which masjid you end up in which street in Jamaica. Or, you know, where you end up in Jackson Heights versus Woodhaven, you're going to end up with a very different khutbah. You know, where you are in Brooklyn can entirely determine your school of thought, your aqidah. Like, depends on where you are in Steinway, in Astoria. It is different. Very, very different. So, you know, I, I ended up in one place, right? I'm, a couple of friends said, you know, you need to come to this halaqa, it's awesome. You need to come there and study. So I, I, came, I was like, hey, I want to learn my religion. And now that I've just discovered this religion, I want to soak it all in. I want to take it all in and I want to live by it. I just want the pure religion. So I go to this group and they teach me that everyone else, unfortunately, outside of this masjid, uh, they think they're Muslim. You see, but they, but they, they don't have the proper beliefs. They're, it's very sad. And we're the only place that has survived with the correct faith. And Allah did say that this is, I know this might seem strange to you, but the Prophet does tell us, Fatuba lil ghuraba, congratulations to the strange ones, we are it. <laughs> you know? And you need to save yourself, and you need to save your faith, so even though you've been, and I, I went enthusiastically in there, yeah, you know, after masjid, after salat, this is how old I am. After Juma, I used to go outside, and used to be a guy, he's still there on 29th Street by Masjid al-Rahman. He used to have a stand with like, you know, nowadays DVDs, but back in the day, VHS, baby, tape cassettes <laughs> of different speakers lined up. And I used to buy one every week and put it in my Walkman. Yes, I had a Walkman. I am not, I'm proud to admit this. You know, and I used to listen to all these different speakers. So I went in there and I said, "Hey, have you heard of this speaker and this speaker?" No, no, ya Kareem. No, no, no. You don't listen to them. These people are calling to the hellfire. You need to protect your faith. You need to have the right beliefs. 
you need to make sure you learn from us. And I said, okay, okay, I'll, I won't listen to those tapes. And I did. And I put those tapes away. And I wouldn't even look at them. And even though I benefited tremendously from them, I said, no, I must be wrong. I must not have thought clearly about this. And I started going to these halaqas. And I'm going week after week after week after week. And I'm getting more and more indoctrinated until I feel I, I, I miss my friends that aren't weird yet. Right? I haven't saved them yet. So I go back to my friends in college. Bro, you got to come to this halaqa. It's amazing. You know, what, what's so amazing about it? It's, it's the only right religion. That's, I mean, why, you know... I mean, I, I love you, you're my bro, we have pizza together every time, but you're headed for the hellfire, bro. You're, I, just, I just feel bad for you. So I need to save you and me, we need to go to Jamaica, and we need to sort this out, right? I didn't mention which masjid in Jamaica on purpose, because there's a lot of them, alhamdulillah. Okay, so anyway, so we're doing this for a while, until I had a friend, slightly older than me, three, four years older than me, that has been around the block a little bit, and one time I'm trying to save his soul, and he sits me down. And he goes, Noman, shut up. <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you two things. You're wrong and you're stupid. <laughs> and now that makes me, but I have the evidence. I have the, 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 the dalil, I have the hadith, I have the ayah. He said, listen, you're being played with. Here's how. And he sits me down for two hours. And I go, but, but, but. And he crushes me. Then I go, but, but, but. And he crushes me again. But, but, but. Okay, fine. I need you to, and I, I understood something then. I need to keep an open mind. This religion is appealing because it asks people to think for themselves. And if you are part of any variation of this religion that is requesting from you to stop what? Thinking. It's no longer Islam. I don't know what that is. It's some mutated version of something. It's not Islam. The, the reflection, the thought, the critical thinking Islam never ends. It never ends. It only adds to our conviction. I'm not talking about the kind of thinking where you go, what if, what if, what if, what if. And you just you run from one doubt to another doubt to another doubt to another doubt. فَهُمْ فِي رَيْبِهِمْ يَتَرَدَّدُونَ Not like that. But when you hear something, you say, where'd you get that from? How do you know that's a valid position? How do, you, how do we authenticate that? What are the scholarly positions behind it? Let's look at this in more depth. I don't doubt my religion, but I'm starting to doubt the way you're looking at this hadith. I'm having a bit of a doubt about the way you explained that ayah. I have a right to have that doubt. I'm not doubting Allah's book. I'm not doubting, doubting the words of the Prophet ﷺ, but I need clarification. And you know what? This deen came to change the stereotype of religion where you, you come into this religion, you learn something about it you don't understand, and you are supposed to ask, critis, criticize. And it's okay if you're not satisfied with the answer and you keep asking until you get an answer. Maybe, it's, maybe you frame the question the wrong way, but until you get to someone who can intellectually sit you down and clarify things to you, you your quest continues. Your journey continues. And it comes with a humility also. Maybe there are ayat of the Quran and there certainly are that I will never understand. Maybe I will never understand hamim. Maybe I will never understand as samawat as Maybe I'll never understand that. That's part of the humility. But I'll keep asking, I'll keep exploring, I'll keep, you know, wondering. My wonder won't stop. That's what the beauty of this faith is. Human beings were granted this beautiful gift of the intellect and now we're being asked not to use it? And when you are asked not to use it, that is when imbalance begins. That's where imbalance begins. And when it happens for a few generations, then we get to the state where we are now. So you're a college student, or you're in your master's program, or you're 27, 28 years old, and you're a woman, and you're looking to get married, but your parents say no, only from Pakistan. And you say, there's a good brother at the college, he hasn't proposed or anything, but I'm, I think that he might be a good match. No, 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 no. If you do this, if you bring this up again, I will kill myself, the mother says. Or the father says, I'm hold he's holding his hand on the Quran, I've seen those too. I'm if you do this, I if you ever bring this again, you are not my daughter. Where did you, what movie did you watch that in, bro? Where, where do you get that from? Like, what, what's with all the drama? Because you have to listen to your parents. You know what this is? And you can't ask questions like, why? What's, what's so wrong with that? You can't, and you will never get a straight answer. Well, because we said. <laughs> because Islam. Islam what? Islam! <laughs> In other words, your answer becomes more legitimate if you raise the volume on the same wrong answer. You know? This was one time, there was this uncle who was like, 
justifying some racist comment he made. And I was like, Uncle, where did you get this from? It's in the books. And I said, which books? All of them. <laughs> Go read. I'm like, oh, I'll be back. <laughs> I can't beat that. <laughs> Just, you got me, you know. <laughs> you know, it's in the books, all of them. Yes, the Mein Kampf is a com pretty fun read. <laughs> like, I, you know. <laughs> but you know, we, this, this generation of Muslims, we got to start at the drawing board. So I was telling you about my journey and I, you know, I didn't ask questions. And I said, and I, because now this one person had kind of shifted my thinking a little bit, I said, maybe he's right. I should trust him. Everything he does, I'm going to do. Because he, he slapped sense into me, you know. And so I'm going to just follow. What do you do? We go, I go to this halaqa. So I go start going to this halaqa. And I attended and I really enjoy it. And so even though they never said this, subconsciously I start thinking everything else must be garbage. These people are so, everybody's just waiting to be slapped by my friend. And if they got slapped by my friend, they'd be in this halakha too. And this journey continued. And I went from one group, one masjid, one ideology, one worldview of Islam to another, to another, to another, to another. Oh, there were lots of them. There were lots of them. Somebody brought me a pamphlet from one of them today. What do you think about this? And I read it, I was like, <laughs> yeah, I've been there. That was 1998, right there, as you know. You guys don't even know. All of this, been there, done that. It's all done. It's old. You know who's still going through this? England. When I go to England, people ask me questions and I chuckle. Like this guy, literally, seriously, I was driving in the car with him. He goes, so, bruv, where do you take your knowledge? Wait, wait, where do you take your knowledge from? You know? Who, who, who are your sheikhs? And I was like, um... Awkward silence for a moment. And I was like, I'm sorry, bro. I, I didn't answer you immediately because uh, I, I, for a second I thought I was traveling through time. Because where do you take your knowledge is a question from 1997. We already finished this. We're past this already. What, what do you, have you been in the same, like, are you, do you visit geocities.com? Where, where, where are you from? Like, this is, some people don't even know what geocities is. That's funny. That's how old I am. Anyway, so, you know, but people were stuck in a rut. We find one thing and we train ourselves to think about Islam one way and everybody else has to think about it this way. And if they don't, they must be wrong. And we have litmus tests for this. I literally used to go visit Masajid in New York where there's a door, there's a guy there, hey. You want the sunnah? <laughs> and I'd be like, what else is there? <laughs> All right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was like a litmus test. What am I going to say? No, of course not. A sunnah, what is that? Like, you know, doesn't make any sense. I went to Masajid in England. Check this out. I went to Mas uh, one Masjid in England. We went to, I went to visit. This is the tragedy of this. We, I went to visit Sheikh Akram Nadwi. Sheikh Abdul Akram is one of the leading muhaddithun of the ummah today. The man has written a 50 volume book on just the female collectors of hadith in Islamic history. Life profiles of 2,500 women. I can't read 50 pages. He's written 50 volumes on this one subject. Just because he said, we, th we think Islamic studies is the realm of men. Um, that's actually historically inaccurate. I'm going to show you why. You know, the, 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 he lists first the teachers of Bu Imam Bukhari rahimahullah that were women and what their lives were, where they studied from, and then the student, among the students, and so on and so forth. It just That 20-minute conversation I had with him at his house, first of all, I was real honored to be at his house, the 20-minute conversation I had in his house answered questions I've had for 10 years. And the people around him don't even know. They don't even know. SubhanAllah. What a tragedy, you know? We, it is so easy for you to dismiss people when you don't know enough. So easy, you know. Allah says, don't do ghulu in your religion. Don't go overboard. So I was going from one group to another, to another, to another, to another, to another. And guess what happened eventually? I burnt out. What does ghulu mean? You go into something too far and you start hating it. Just burnt out. Not going to the masjid. Not really hanging out with anybody. Just kind of depressed. Just depressed. And the only time you hear about Islam is you hear one group delegitimizing another. 
speaking out against another. That's all you hear. You don't hear anything about Islam itself. You just don't hear it. So I th started thinking back about all these groups. That all, I've, all the groups I've been through. All the different masjids, all the different halaqas, all the different shaykhs. All of them. And I realized something. All of them had something beautiful. They had something very ugly. And they also had something very beautiful. Why should I let go of the beautiful parts? Why should I do that? Why can't I hold on to the good stuff? And keep it. And my litmus test, I don't impose this on you, my litmus test became the moment any group starts speaking out against another, I'm going to put the mute button on. I don't care about that stuff. I just need to learn something that will make me a better Muslim. That's all I care about. All I, and if you give me something that will make me think of my brother and my sister as less, I don't, I don't want that. It just not interest, doesn't interest me. It takes away from my love of other Muslims. I, I, I can't take it. I will still disagree with Muslims. I will disagree with scholars even sometimes, respectfully. But I will never use that to think less of them. That's going overboard in your religion. You can love the ideas you believe in, but don't hate the people who don't believe in them. It's not cool. That's actually pride. You know? This is a battlefield of ideas. I am free to share my ideas. You are free to disagree with me. And after even the strongest disagreement, if we can openly talk in a space where none of us are threatened, none of us are raising our voices, you know, none of us are going crazy. We can just have a civil conversation. That's when this ummah moves forward. Where is the conversation? We've become a people that talk at each other. Everybody gives a, if somebody, you know what we do? Somebody, you know, gives a speech, somebody gives a counter speech. Somebody writes an article, somebody writes a counter article. Nobody says, let me give this brother a call and let me share with him, here are my disagreements with you. What do you think about them? Let's have a conversation about it. I invite you to my house and let's discuss. Let, let our kids play together. Let our wives meet. And let us just talk about this, you know, this issue that I don't agree with you in. I want to know your perspective. When do we do that? Isn't that brotherhood? Isn't that brotherhood? Instead of talking at people, you talk to them. You talk to them. People told me some time ago about myself. I don't really care. Honestly, I don't care what people say online. It doesn't phase me at all. I don't have the time. I have too many things to do for my parents and my kids and my students to worry about what happens online. Honestly. You know? So, people don't, oh, you, you know, they're saying that you follow some deviant tafsir. I was like, who are they? I want to go to their house. Can I invite them to my house? I'm, I may have good ice cream in my house. I'd love to sit and talk to them. No, 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 the, 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 the great scholars have refuted you. I was like, okay, that's great. What does re refutation mean? Can I, can I still come out of my house? Do I have to wear a headband of some special sort? What does that mean? You re refuted me. What does a Muslim do refuting another Muslim? What, how does that work? If you don't like what I have to say, which is perfectly fine, I'm no prophet. You're no prophet. It's okay if we don't like what each other have, has to say. You can come to me and say I disagree with you. You can write to me and say, you know, here's what I don't like. Here are my concerns. This is why one of my best friends in life is Sheikh Omar Suleiman. Honestly, I love this man. I just, I really love him. He's, he's, my, he's my bigger, younger brother. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's confused, an oxymoron walking around. Um, but you know, he, he'll listen to something I said and he'll go at me and say, you shouldn't have said that. That's wrong. I was like, okay, I'll undo that one in the next khutbah. Okay, cool. He says something, I say, hey, why do you say that, man? That hurt. Don't you think someone will get hurt with that? He's like, yeah, you're right. Okay, I'll undo that one. We can openly talk to each other. We can disagree. We can have a conversation. That is when ghulu dies. When, our, when we stop talking to each other and we start quick, quick to judge, quick to judge, quick to judge. Quick to validate your own position. You're so in love with your own position, you can't let it go. I was in that. I was in these, when I was in a group, I loved that group. I was that group. I was the ambassador of that group. And when I heard something that countered the ideas I was carrying, I was ready to crush it. Oh boy, you better not stand in front of me when you give me a counter delete. I will destroy you. I memorized all the lines. I know where, which angle you're going to come from, bro. I trained myself in this. I did. But then I realized my loyalty is no longer to Islam. My loyalty has become to these particular understandings of Islam and the way I'm protecting them. I have to check myself. I've, I've caged myself and I'm trying to cage others. 
So years go by when I realize this and I dedicate myself to one thing. I realize I, I will never be under, able to understand all of Islam, it's too big for me. I'm going to dedicate myself to tr trying to better my own understanding of the language and some things about Allah's book. Maybe if I can get one or two drops out of Allah's book, I will lead a happy life, I'll be, I'll be okay. So I focused myself on that for the last 10 years. And in that time, as I traveled, I would meet some kids that are still in one of those, you know, those, one of those phases that I've already been through. And they sit me down, brother, you know, nice speech, but I have some concerns. And they'll walk me through the spiel. But I know the spiel, bro. I used to do it myself. So he gets to point one and point two, and I stop him at point three. I say, hey, wait, wait, wait. This was point three, right? And this was the point four you were going to make? He goes, uh, maybe. And I was like, how long have you been attending the halakas? He goes, what halakas? He goes, you know, I, you know, I know. I know, bro. Because perhaps I've been attending some halakas. I was like, yeah, and you have hookah late, late night afterwards? Discussing how you're going to bring Islam to society? Usually Miss Fajr, haven't called your parents in a while? Developed a smoking habit in addition to the hookah that wasn't enough for you? Perhaps. <laughs> and then I said, listen, bro. I know you really want to do this for Islam. You want to debate me for Islam. But I just, I'm asking you two things. Call your mom and dad every day and pray Fajr. Just work on that. Okay? We'll establish Islam together. Just work on that. You get caught up in this stuff, in one thing or another, and the world becomes nothing to you. And I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, when you get caught up in these ideologies, the first thing to suffer is your family. The first thing to suffer. I'm, be I'm being very real with you. This is Ghulu and Deen for us. We, get, we hang on to one idea, we tell ourselves we're serving Islam by spending nights and nights and nights discussing something or another at these late night restaurants with questionable content on the TV screens. And we do this in, on Steinway Street and we do this on Atlantic Avenue, I know. We do this on Atlantic Avenue, we do this by Chicken Guy, right? And we do this and then, uh, you know, the, uh, the mother doesn't know where you are, the father doesn't know where you are. Nobody's ever checked the cash on your laptop. You know? And we do this and we think we're serving Islam. Doing something for our deen. Stop kidding yourself. The first thing the deen fixes is your relationships. If you're really serving your deen, you would see a tremendous change in your relationships. The way you are with your brother, your sister, your parents. You know? Your love, the, the ones closest to you are drawn to the perfection of your akhlaq. That was what the Rasul did first. He had that even before Risala. He had the perfection of akhlaq. Character. The people most impressed with him were his family. Today, you will find young people, when they get into the field of da'wah, the people least impressed with them are who? Their family. Everybody else, oh! And the family says, eh. <laughs> you know? Honestly. Honestly. You want to become a speaker. You want to give da'wah to people. You want to convince people of Islam. Where's, your Where's time with your family? This is ghulu in religion. We've got to balance all of this stuff. And if you're living in New York, you're already used to balancing crazy numbers of things. You've got work, you're living hand to mouth. It's not an easy life here. It's one of the most expensive places to live in the world. That's where you chose to live. You know? I know, I know you don't think there's nothing outside of this in America. Everybody else has got straw in their mouth and they're just, you know, <laughs> and a banjo in the trunk. You know? <laughs> my, I call some of my old friends. How's Texas? Dong 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 dong. <laughs> like, pretty good out there, you know. So, so, so. but uh, you you live here, so yeah, it's hard, even harder to balance here because you have time for nothing. You have time for nothing. You leave six in the morning, an hour and a half, forty-five minutes, whatever it is, in the subway, and after being pushed around in the bus, then you go to work, then you go to school, then you do some more work, then you. Get some pizza and then you get back in the train and then by the time you get home, you're done. You, you don't see your parents, you don't see the wife, you don't see the child, you don't see nothing. You know? And you know what? If that's the case with you, you need to figure out a way to make time for your family. The, the balanced approach to religion means you learn to balance all of this stuff. And you don't lose your soul in the process. If you have 45 minutes on the train, then just memorize some Quran at that time. Keep yourself busy with something productive. Do some ibadah. Every second will count. When you, every letter you recite is 10 good deeds. Imagine how much you can rack up over time. I remember memorizing Surah Al-Isra and Surah Al-Kahf on the subway when I was in college. You know? One ayah a day. 
I was I didn't even know Arabic at the time. I was just like, okay, I'm just going one ayah day, one ayah day, one ayah day. You know? It's not hard. You could do it. So now at least you have some spiritual avenue. Maybe you didn't get to sit looking at the sky. Maybe you didn't get to do Qiyam al in a masjid. But you've got to find ways to serve, to, to f- f- fulfill the needs of your, of your heart during your day. You have to make that time. You have to make the time to reach out to your parents. And text messages aren't enough. Text mess- I'll call you later. That's not, that's not, I'll talk to my parents. I told my mom I'll call her later. You want to text her? Tell her you, she lo- you love her. And if you tell your mother you love her, and she says, no you don't. That means there's something wrong with you. That means you, you keep saying it, but you've done nothing for it. You've never spent any time with her. You've been ignoring her. So those words offend her because she can see right through them. So you don't get, I told my mom I love her. She said, no, you don't. No, actually she said, where's the proof? You've been, you've been ignoring me all this time. Well, saying I love you changes everything. These are empty words to you. If you love someone, you spend time with them. Without your phone. Without your laptop. You sit with them. If you love your father, you do that. You spend time with them. You know? For the young men here, learn to get up for Fajr, man. Stop hanging out late night. It's New York. I'm just being real. We could give theoretical lectures. You're not getting up for Fajr. Wake up. Stop going to sleep late. That's balance in your religion. Don't go out late night. I know the restaurants are open till whenever. I know you're used to the nightlife. I know. It's tempting. It's fun. When else are you going to do it? You need to let loose. There should be a time you can let loose. That's fine. But if it's hurting your salat, man, you just got to stop. You got to find some other way. You know? Young men here, you know, you should have a relationship with a masjid where you go where nobody knows you and you go every once in a couple of weeks and you spend a few hours just sitting there reciting Quran to a wall. You're just sitting there on your own. Nobody's around you. You're just doing ibadah. It'll, It'll help you. It'll give you peace. If you can't go to a masjid, go to like Flushing Meadows Park and sit by the water and recite Quran. Or nobody cares about any, nobody's, nobody's going to be around. You know? Just do that. You have to find that time. This is ghulu in religion. And if, we don't, and if we don't find it, and when you get ghulu in religion, things go crazy. The Christians developed ghulu, overboard attitudes in their religion. It led them to even worshipping their prophet. That's why it's mentioned twice. لا تغلو في دينكم غير الحق the second time in Surah Al-Ma'idah, without any justification. You're going to go overboard in one thing or another without justification. It's going to mess you up and mess the people up around you. The final bit of advice that I have for myself and for all of you, when it comes to a balanced approach to religion, this is my final bit of advice. I, I pray you take it seriously. And this is something I've, it saved me a lot of trouble. And I hope it saves you a lot of trouble too. In my personal life, this is something personal. I realize that in Islam, in the realm of Islam, No one scholar, no one school of thought, no one person, no one individual has all the answers. And they shouldn't. Allah didn't do that. Allah made us shu'ub, which means we depend on one another. Just the nature of things. So if somebody is giving you knowledge of aqidah, for example, you're studying aqidah, which is a great thing to study, that doesn't necessarily mean that's your source for fiqh. If you're studying fiqh from someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that's your source for tafsir. If you're studying tafsir with someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that's your source for hadith. If you're studying hadith with someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that's your source for history. You have to go to people that are specialists in their field. If you really want genuine answers and deep and profound answers, you have to go to people that specialize in their fields. One of the things that's caused an insane amount of damage to Islam in the last century is people who know a little about a lot of things. When you have a little bit about a lot of things, it seems like it's a lot of knowledge, but none of it is deep. You see? You can quote a lot of different things, but you have depth in nothing. You see? Somebody came to me during the question and answer session and asked me about uh, uh, you know, donating, donating body parts, donating organs. I don't know. But you study the Qur'an, yes, that's a fiqh question. I don't know. That's not my field. You need to ask someone who knows. That's a, that's a hard question. Somebody asked me a question about aqidah or about history. I don't know. You need to ask somebody who studies aqidah in depth and they can pr- explain it to you in a way that is more appropriate to the, the concerns you have. 
I can't answer that. What about this hadith? Is this sahih? I don't know. But it's in Bukhari. I still don't know because that's not my field. People write about me and they complain. Somebody emailed me, why don't you ever talk about hadith? I said, because I'm not a muhadith. Because I have too much respect for that subject. I only quote a hadith, I only mention a hadith if I have sat with a scholar myself and have understood it from a scholar. And I've done that with only a few hadith. I've, I've read a lot of a hadith. I've studied a lot of a hadith. I don't talk about them because I have too much respect for that subject. I don't want to make that a casual subject. Because I've seen the damage that does. I've seen the damage it does when a high school or a college student Googles a uh, uh, hadith on this, that, or the other, and they don't even know the Arabic, nor the chain of narration, nor the nuances, nor the context, and they're ready to quote it in the face of their MSA friend who they're trying to beat in an election or something. I've seen it. That's a disrespect to the words of Rasulullah These words are sacred. You have to have some respect for them. Some respect for the nuance that's in them. And you can do a lot of damage to people. If you don't know what you're talking about, you, can, you think you're quoting the words of Rasul you're doing damage to people. And that's why not only should we not speak about things we don't have deep knowledge of, don't talk, you know, you can give people advice. You can tell people about being regular in their prayer. You can tell people to stop lying, stop being angry. These are universal pieces of advice. You don't need to be a scholar for those things. But when it comes to shari matters, what's halal and what's haram, you know, what should a married couple do when they're having trouble? They shouldn't be going to a faqih, they should be going to a counselor. That's a counseling realm. That's not a, that's not a, no, what does Islam say about my husband who does this, this, this? No, 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 no. There's a lot more to that story than your husband doing this, this, this. There's, there's, you've been married for some time. There's a lot of issues there you need to sort out before you say my husband does X, Y, Z. I need an Islamic answer. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. You're oversimplifying and you're trying to use the religion as a weapon against your loved one. Don't do it. And don't do it against your wife either. Husband and wife don't get along, and hus- the wife is crying, and he says, what's the matter? No, I don't, don't talk to me, I don't want to talk to you. And he quotes the hadith, you know, the, if you're displeased with me, the angels will curse you the entire night. <laughs> it's a sahih hadith. It's a sahih hadith. But you know what? You know what? Even if she turns towards you, even if she turns towards you, you think it's because of love? Is that love? You just, you were okay with threatening her with the curse of angels? You call that a marriage? Is that why the Rasul gave that sallallahu alayhi wa Shame on you. How dare you quote that? People beat their wives and they say, Ar-rijal qawamuna ala nisa How dare you? How dare you disrupt the word of Allah like that? Ar-rijal qawamuna ala nisa You even know what that means? Qawam. I gave khutbah about that in JMC when I came last. The word qawam is actually qaf, wow, and meme. It shares a root with one of Allah's names, al-qayyum. Al-qayyum is actually, a, one of, you know, Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyu. Al-qayyum. When a, when the Arabic language is sacred because Allah chose it for Quran. And within the Arabic language, the letters that make up Allah's names are even more sacred. So when you think you know what qawam means, think again, it's a letter. These are letters that are one of the names of Allah, come from these letters. So before you draw any conclusions, study, know what it means first. And it means caretaker, the one who stands up for someone, the one who does activities with someone. It has over a hundred meanings and beating is not one of them. Neither is authority. Neither is authority. Terrible transition, men are authority over women. The authority of men is established in other ayat, not this one. So we know what you're talking about. That's blasphemous. You know? This is ghulu in deen. This is the abuse of religion. That's what we have to prevent as a people. This is what, it's happening and it hurts. I hear people quote ayat and a hadith. Just because somebody's quoting ayat and a hadith doesn't mean they're right. Their own imbalance is seeing things in an imbalanced way. You have to become critical thinkers. You can't look at something in a shallow way and say, okay, 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 that's what it is. No, 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 no. I need more understanding. I need depth. I don't care if you don't know the whole Quran. It's okay. If you know two ayat, know them in depth. I don't care if you don't know all of the Bukhari. It's fine. If you know two ayat, two two hadith, you know one dua, know it in depth. Know it well. Spend time on one thing. You know? Really internalize it and then move on. Then move on to something else. It's all become about quantity and not quality. You know? Can you imagine if the ocean that looks so beautiful, by the way, if the ocean wasn't as deep as it is, it was just six inches deep, it would still look like it does. From a distance, you'd say, oh wow. 
But there's no depth. That's what we've become in our Islam. No depth. And no appreciation for depth. Those of you who listen to my khutbahs, how many ayat do I quote in a khutbah? Usually how many ayat, you know? Young guys come and ask me, uh, Sad, I'm giving khutbah for the first time. Can you give me a bunch of ayat? <laughs> and they write like a four-page thesis that they're going to, today's khutbah is going to be about taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he says, and he says, and oh, what else did he say? Where did it go? Okay, Ms. Salat. When you're quoting one ayah, one hadith, one ayah, one hadith, one ayah, one hadith, one story, one ayah, one hadith, you didn't stop at one ayah. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Why don't they think deeply about the Qur'an? لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ So they, they can think deeply about the ayat. This is thinking deeply or just moving along? I mean, when you see a beautiful mountain, do you just say, oh, that's nice? Do you do that? Or do you just stand there and go, whoa. When you see an incredible painting, do you just stand there stunned by it or you just go, hmm. We don't even do that with things Allah created in this world. We're stunned. Nobody goes to the beach for one second. Oh, such a beautiful sun. Oh well. Next thing, mountain. Where's the mountain? Let's look at the mountain. Let's get this out of the way. You know? When, you are, when you're experiencing something beautiful, you want to stop. You want to taste it. You want to take it in. You want to be able to appreciate it. Because this might not come again. Why don't we have that attitude towards the, the text? Because we have ghulu. Just give me the quick version. Give me the quick version. Let me move. This book is so beautiful. The sunnah is so beautiful. The Rasul's words, sallallahu alayhi wa are so beautiful. They will make you cry if you just spend time on them. If you want to find balance in your life, I know I said the last advice. Can I give you one more bit of advice? One last one. I promise. One last one. If you and I want to find, find balance in our lives, here's where we begin. We begin by conversing with Allah. If you're not personally talking to Allah, you're never going to find balance in Islam. Talking to Allah means you have to learn the etiquette, the manners of making dua. You have to learn what it means to pray to Allah. And it's okay. If you don't know Arabic and you don't memorize well, you can pray to Allah in Urdu. It's fine. Punjabi, I'm not sure. But Urdu is fine. You should be okay with Urdu. Okay? If IUD is Guyanese, it's okay. Okay, but it's good for you if you were to memorize some of the prayers of the Prophet ﷺ because that's how he used to converse with Allah. Our Messenger, Allah conversed with him and he conversed back with Allah. The Qur'an is how Allah conversed with him. The du'as of the Prophet are how the Prophet ﷺ conversed with Allah. It's a two-way conversation, right? So every Muslim should own a, you know, a copy of the fortress of the Muslim. You should have a plan on how in the next week you're going to know one more dua. Just one, as a family, the whole family will learn one more dua and you'll sit there and you'll think about what Allah is asking you to say when you enter the house. What are you actually saying? When you enter the masjid, what are you actually saying? Think about it. It'll make you different people. It will just absolutely make you different people. And it will make you comfortable speaking to your master. And those who speak to their master, Allah guides them in ways you can't even imagine. You would think, Ustaz, in the middle of all of these groups, and all of these ideologies, and all of this information on the internet, and all of the attacks on Islam, there's so much confusion. How in the world are we supposed to find guidance? How are we going to find guidance? And my answer to you is, if you talk to Allah then you could be in the darkest times and in the most hopeless situation and Allah will find a way to guide you. This is how I wanted to end this. The story of Robert de Villa. You know who that is? No, you don't, because I do. <laughs> uh, three months ago, I gave khutbah in Fort Worth. I haven't been to that masjid in four or five years and they invited me for some reason and I went. And I gave khutbah there. My khutbah was about dua. An Egyptian fellow comes up to me, a young man came up to me afterwards, he goes, Allah fulfilled my dua today. And I said, what's your dua? He said, my dua was that Norman Ali Khan should meet Robert de Villa. I was like, <laughs> are you Robert de Villa? He goes, nope, I am not Robert de Villa. Robert de Villa is my friend, but I think Allah is fulfilling my dua. I was like, fire away, I want to know. Robert de Villa is a young man who lives in a town 40 minutes past Fort Worth. He's a, he was a farmer, young guy. 
and he was hit with some sort of genetic disorder that kicked in later on in his life and he became paralyzed from the neck down. And he was, he's actually, he lives in a nursing home. Uh, most people in that nursing home are 90 years, 100 years. They're really, really old people. And then there's, you know, his room where he's paralyzed neck down. He's the only 30-something year old that is in the nursing home, okay? And he's been in that nursing home for the last 10 years. His family got a computer for him that's voice activated so he can give voice commands, put a headphone on and Google stuff and search stuff so he can surf the web and find information. In his room, in his room, and by the way, staunch Christian family, the minister comes and prays for him every, every, you know, every week and things like that. And his best friend was in the bed next to him. One of his best friends. He became best friends because he met him at the nursing home. This person was also paralyzed and he needed a new liver. Okay? A liver transplant. He was waiting for a liver, liver transplant. And they used to talk about you know, God and things like that all the time. They were good friends. Finally, his best friend got a call that there's a donor available for the liver. So he's so excited. He goes, Robert, I'm going to miss you, but I'm going. I've got a, I've got a donor. So they take his friend and they go on the op, into the operation and his friend died at the operating table. Now his friend, uh, who's also a Christian, the, the deceased friend, his sister, took one of the, the amulets of his friend, a, a crucifix, and she gave it as a gift to Robert. This is a reminder of your old buddy. So he hung it on the side of his hospital bed. Robert de Villa lives a pretty decent life in there. The nurses take care of him. He's a happy guy. And one day he goes to sleep and he sees a man in his dream. That man says his name is Muhammad. And he says, pointing at the crucifix, God did not send messengers so they would worship the messengers. God sends mes sent messengers so they could, you could worship God. And Jesus was just a man. He walked in the markets and he ate food. He walked in the markets and he ate food and the dream stopped. He only knows that Jesus was just a man. He knows there's a man that named Muhammad that said that to him. He said that messengers came so people could worship God and not the messengers. This is all he knows. So he starts Googling Muhammad. He finds Islam. He takes Shahada. When he takes Shahada, he wants to learn about the Quran. So he goes on these chat sessions and finds somebody needs to teach me Quran. He finds a brother in Egypt that he gets together with on Skype to try to learn Arabic. Learned the Arabic alphabet. Once he learned the Arabic alphabet, he learned to recite the Quran. He memorized 10 surahs from his hospital bed. Then he said, I'm beginning to memorize the Quran and I'm beginning to learn about this prophet, but I need to understand the Quran. So he starts Googling how to understand the Quran. And for some reason, he ends up on my videos. And he starts watching my stuff. And he watched almost everything. And then he told, and then, here's the other, here's the kicker. In the nursing home, there was an Egyptian fellow that used to come in and do some repair, uh, you know, repair work. The Egyptian fellow has his own awesome story. The guy had basically lost faith. He wasn't religious. The nearest masjid to him was 50 miles away. So he didn't really go to Jum'ah much anymore. But he felt a spiritual vo void, so he started going to the church just to feel closer to Allah. Raised Muslim. He goes to the church just to feel closer to Allah. He's passing by Robert's room one day and he hears, Wal asri inna al insana lafi khusr. So he walks into his room and says, Robert, what are you listening to? Robert says, Nothing. That was me. And the guy says, You're Muslim? He goes, Yeah, I became Muslim. And now this friend is in shock. How does Allah guide someone in the middle of church town, USA? in a nursing home with a crucifix on the side of his bed that he doesn't even have the physical strength to move and the guy himself says I want to come back to Allah so he tells him about his, you know, the friend he found online Norman Ali Khan so the Egyptian fellow starts watching my videos and then he says I wish I could meet him one day and he says okay I'll, I'll pray for you and after five years that Egyptian friend shows up at the same masjid that I haven't been to in four years. And after Jum'ah says, I think Allah wants to fulfill my friend's dua and my dua. So I said, I think he does. Let's go. So I took a few of us and we went. And we met with Robert. We had a beautiful conversation with him. And inshallah, uh, for, uh, for Eid, we're going to go to his, uh, his, his nursing home again. They were actually, the nursing home was pretty shocked. You're all here to meet Robert? Like, yep. 
Yep. Uh, why do you want to meet him? Uh, he's an inspiration. <laughs> like, okay, let me check if we can. And they had to call the, hosp the, the, the hospice administrator and all this stuff. And then eventually let us in. And Robert's in shock. And then I meet with Robert. We're talking. And I was like, hey, Robert, so I heard you memorize some surahs. He says, yeah. Can you recite one for me? So he recited Surah al -Hasr. Not one of us was not crying. We're just in tears. When, uh, when somebody turns to Allah, when somebody turns to Allah, don't worry about the means. Guidance will come. Balance will come. I want to tell you some more about Robert because young guys are here. Young guys that play basketball. Young guys that are healthy. Young guys that have ambition. I told you, what's his paralysis from where to where? Neck down. He has a special wheelchair that has to hold pretty much every part of his body in place. He can't just sit in a wheelchair. It holds his neck and it holds every other part of his body in place because he has no control over his limbs. And he has to have a special van where the wheelchair locks in so that if it goes through a bump or whatever, he doesn't you know, receive the shock. So he made a request. He wants to go to the Friday prayer. They didn't have the special van. So they put him in a regular van. And so he went in the regular van in a few bumps and his spine got even more hurt. He went to Jumu'ah. He came back in excruciating pain. And they said, I'm sorry, Robert, you're no longer able to sit in your wheelchair. You're going to have to stay in your bed for the next six months at least. If you see recovery, then you can get back up again. I met him in, those, in that span. He'd already been in that bed for, for three months already. And the reason he was in that bed is he went to the Jumu'ah prayer. And he told me about the Jumu'ah prayer. He said, I've never felt more peace in my life then I was in that masjid. And you know what I'm going to do, Brother Naman? When I can, when I can sit in my chair again, I'm going to go to Jumu'ah. I'm going to go to the masjid because I've never felt like that before. There's someone who has nothing but control over his, his mouth and his eyes. And he says, I only find peace in the masjid. And here we are. These masajid, I don't care what ideology, what school of thought, what they're talking about in the masjid, what fitna is there. I don't care, it's still Allah's house. Just go to pray. Don't go there to talk to people. Go there to talk to Allah. Just go to talk to Allah. You're, not, you're just going for you and Allah. That's it. That's it. Other things will come, but you're not going for them. You're just going there to find peace. You'll become different people. If Allah can guide Robert de Villa, Allah can guide everybody. And then he said, you know, sometimes I wonder why Allah put me in this position. And then I say to myself, what am I kidding? Allah has given me so much. I am so grateful for what He gave me. And if this is the way He was going to bring me to Islam, it's all worth it. So worth it. You have Muslims that lose a little bit of health. And they say, why is Allah doing this to me? And this man, I mean, if you would think, nowadays atheists argue because of suffering, there is no God. If one man has a position in a position to say, I, I don't believe in God. If there was a guy, why would I be in this position? It would be Robert de Villa. That guy would say, I don't believe in God. If there was one, why would I be in this mess? And yet he's in this position and I've never seen a face with more nur. Never. I've never seen a face that has more contentment on it. He's so satisfied with life. He's so happy. He's just happy. The last seven or eight khutbas I've given are actually based on one sentence per, each on one sentence that he said in his conversation. <laughs> Is that profound? He's, been, he's a teacher to me. I consider him a teacher. He's my sheikh. Somebody says, who's your sheikh? I say, Robert Davila. <laughs> really? Is that, a, is that a pizza place? Or <laughs> no. <laughs> you know. You know. People, the guidance is all around us. You don't have to get worried about what's not there. There's plenty there. You know what Allah did for the people of the cave? You know He even guided them in where to sleep? You know He even guided them on where to turn? As the sun was coming, they turned away from it. As the sun came from the other side, they turned the other way. <laughs> Allah will guide you in your sleep when you make dua to Him. He'll even guide you in your sleep. Every toss and turn will be guided by Allah. Can you imagine? Who's, we shouldn't be skeptical in Allah's guidance. We shouldn't worry about how am I going to find balance. No, that's Allah's job to guide you. Your job is to talk to Him. Your job is to get sincere. That is the message I have for you. That is how we're going to find balance. Honestly.
Well, it's, you know, and if once you do that, once you become sincere to Allah, Allah will open doors. Allah will give you friends. Allah will give you teachers. Allah will give you access to resources. All of which are going to bring you closer and closer and closer to Him and to the truth and make life better for the people around you. This is really the gist of what I wanted to share with you. I don't want to speak longer. I've spoken too long already. I love coming back to New York and I'm so, so grateful for Queens College. And the, the MSA here, mashallah, they put up with me. I give them a hard time and they still put up with me. I show up half an hour late and they're still really nice to me. They didn't give me the look of death that I used to give to speakers when I was the MSA guy. And Imam Siraj Wahad showed up 40 minutes and I was like, Mom. <laughs> and then he used to, it's okay, Nootman, it's okay, it's okay. You're doing good, Nootman, you're doing good. I was like, okay. Okay, fine, since you put it that way. I shall accept that, you know. But I'm very grateful for you guys, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, putting up with this crowd, we're not easy to deal with. We have lots of complaints too, so if you see an MSA person, just, you know, pat them on the back or say thank you or whatever. Appreciate the effort that they've done. I'd also like to thank all the moms that are here with their little kids, because that's hard. It got hot in here, and it's, it's I'm, I'm amazed at the children that didn't scream and yell more than what I heard. I didn't, I hear, I heard very little. Where's the crazy kid that was over here? <laughs> oh. oh, that was her? Oh, iPhone, okay. Okay, that's the other uh, thing I'm grateful for. And finally, of course, I'd like to, um, I want to share some, can I share some news with you? Is that okay with you? Okay, this is cool. So uh, I went to, uh, last summer I got a chance to go to Malaysia. And alhamdulillah, I made some really cool friends in Malaysia. It was a, like a life-altering trip. I, the part of the trip was Singapore and also stopped over in Bahrain and uh, had the honor of being at the International Islamic University of Malaysia. And I uh, spoke also with a number of media outlets there. And I realized something. Uh, we've been cooking an idea back home in, in the Bayina laboratories, uh, which basically has to do with bringing uh, meaningful content to Muslims. I think, alhamdulillah, the lecture thing is great, uh, but it can only go so far. Right? What we really, really need is engaging media. Well, I think it's really important that we have engaging media. So we have this idea for a, um, basically a talk show, uh, but that's a mix of social commentary, special reports, and accomplished Muslims. Like I want to interview people that are doing cool things in the Ummah. I want, people, I want to have journalism that's positive about the things that are happening in the Muslim world. So there's interest already, and they're trying to pick it up in, in Malaysia, inshallah ta'ala, make dua that that works out. And I'm going in Ramadan again to, yes, I know, I got it, I got it. <laughs> so... But the cool thing is, we are actually going to build uh, Bayina Studios. I want to make, I want to beat Oprah um, <laughs> in Texas, inshallah. We're building a, we're hoping to actually buy a church that's on sale and turn it into a, like a live audience studio and start talk shows and discussions there that will be broadcast online and it will also be broadcast in TV stations around the world, inshallah ta'ala. Now, if you would like to contribute towards that, we don't do fundraising, but what we do ask you to do is subscribe to Bayina TV, Bayina.tv, because the next couple of months of subscriptions are going to go towards the purchase of the campus. You subscribe and you get access to the translation of the Quran, the Arabic courses, all the stuff that's on there, and all the new stuff that's coming on there. How many people are familiar with Bayina TV here? Quite a few, mashallah. That's great. Uh, so the sisters, uh, this might interest you, the two new upcoming things on Bayina TV, the recent one was the hijab lecture. Uh, what is hijab anyway? So I did a, like a four-hour piece on just the ayah of hijab. Because there's some confusion about it, apparently. So I figured, let's just talk about the ayah. Let's sort that out a little bit. And the next ayah that I'm going to be working on in a month and a half's time is the ayah about beating women. Uh, because if we don't love the ayat, where's our iman? If the ayat are giving us trouble, then we have to fix that, don't we? We have to love the ayat. Thank you so very, very much for listening and being patient with me. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.